Here, I need to stop the music. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to Retrieving the Real History, uh, Exploring the Margaret Randall's Archives at UNM. I'm Liz Hutchison. I'm a faculty in the Department of History and also director of the Feminist Research Institute, all of which leads me to this precise moment. Um, a reminder that after this panel that I'm about to present, we will have a, a panel a conversation uh, by Gioconda Belli and Margaret Randall at 4 p.m. our time. And um, before I get started and do a brief introduction of our panel, I'd like to welcome a special guest, uh, Margaret Randall, who's also here to greet you. Thank you so much, uh, Liz. Um, can you hear me, everyone? Uh, I hope so. So good afternoon to everyone, participants and guests, and special thanks to Naomi Amris, Dr. Jessica Fraser, Barbara Corbel, Gabriela Silva, and Dr. Roberto Tejada for coming together for what I know is going to be an exciting panel. And of course, to Jukonda Belli for the interview conversation that will happen later this afternoon. I know we're all eager to hear what our panelists have to say, but I do want to take a moment to thank a number of people whose really hard work, especially in this time of pandemic, have made this day possible. Um, the University of New Mexico's Center for Southwest Studies has curated my archives, photographic as well as literary, for almost two decades now. Uh, Tomas Jane is the center's director and I thank him for his support. Fran Wilkinson, Interim Dean of the University Libraries, as well as the Willard Endowment, gave valuable encouragement and support to this event. My appreciation also to all the campus departments and programs, the Lannan Foundation, Sally Bingham, and Gay Block, who provided financial aid. No one, though, has worked harder than Dr. Liz, Liz Hutchinson it was her vision that conceived this celebratory event and her tireless creativity that brought it all together from sparking interest, consulting periodically with me, raising the money, to inviting the panelists in Jaconda and dealing with numerous technical details, I think up until just about five minutes ago, right? So my gratitude to all of these individuals and entities as well as to all those behind the screens, the scenes. Thank you. And now back to you, Liz. Thank you so much, Margaret. Uh, I am so grateful also that Margaret was able to um, thank all of our sponsors and supporters. And I thank all of you coming to us from so many parts of the world and the United States, as well as New Mexico. I'm going to just briefly give the uh, introduction of panelists in the order that they're going to speak. Our plan is for the first hour to uh, have those presentations followed by discussion led by those questions that you choose to put in the Q&A box in the fabulous Zoom webinar. Um, first in uh, speaking to us will be Gabriela Silva Ibergüen, who comes to us from Mexico City. She has a master's degree in American literature from El Colegio de San Luis, de San Luis Potosí, Mexico. Following her presentation will be Barbara Corbal, a PhD student in the history department at UNM and a fellow at the library who has been processing the recent requisitions of Margaret Randall's photographic and manuscript archives. Following Barbara will be Roberto Tejada, the Hugh Roy and Lily Kranz Cullen Distinguished Professor in Creative Writing and Art History at the University of Houston. Naomi Ambris follows. She's a fourth year PhD student in American Studies at the University of New Mexico. Finally, Jessica Frazier joins us, uh, a newly minted associate professor at the History of Rhode Island. I'm going to let them do further introductions, 
and get us all started, reminding you that you can put uh, questions uh, into the Q&A box in Spanish or in English, and we will endeavor to keep this as bilingual an event as possible. Thank you, and I hand this over to Gabriela. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Um, thanks for being here. I'll introduce myself very briefly. I am an independent scholar in Mexico City. Um, I have a master's degree in Ever-American Literature from El Colegio de San Luis at San Luis Potosí, Mexico. And my master thesis was about the history of the little magazine El Corno Emplumado. Today, I will talk about some of Margaret Randall's work in El Corno Emplumado during the 60s and some of its links with her archive at UNM. But first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Elizabeth Hutchinson and the University of New Mexico for inviting me to this panel. And of course, I would also like to thank my maestra, Margaret Randall, for her generosity and commitment to new scholars. I am very lucky to count myself among these. So um, I wrote some notes on Margaret's first steps in writing, editing, and translation, specifically while she acted as the editor of a little magazine called El Corno Emplumado during the 60s in Mexico City, which is of great relevance to the Mexican literary landscape. But I would also like to note that at the Margaret Randall Archive at the Center for Southwest Research and Special Collections, we can find documents that can complete the whole picture of Margaret's artistic endeavors. For seven years during the 60s, Margaret Randall co-edited El Corno Emplumado with Mexican poet and former husband, Sergio Mondragón. Together, they published uninterruptedly 28 issues every three months until Mondragón left the magazine in October 1968. A month. Hi, we seem to have a frozen screen problem. Gabriela, we are hoping to get you back. There you are. Um, I think I'm having some technical problems. We can hear you. OK, thank you. OK, sorry. Okay, so together they publish uninterruptedly 28 issues every three months until Mondragón left the magazine in October 1968, a month in Mexican history that will not be forgotten because of the Tlatelolco massacre, when the Mexican armed forces attacked unarmed civilians, most of them students, that were protesting the lack of civil rights, freedom of speech, police brutality, etc. Thousands were arrested and hundreds lost their lives. October 2nd, 1968, the day it all happened, opened a wound that still hurts in Mexican memory. In July of that year, both Randall and Mondragón expressed their support to the students in the editor's note of El Corno Emplumado. From the moment those words were printed, not only did national institutions withdraw their economic support for the magazine, but the editors were targeted by undercover policemen. Suspicious men parked in front of their home. Policemen dressed as civilians, followed them or left threatening notes in their cars. The small printing presses that they used to print El Corno were raided to sabotage the publishing. Among other things, this drove Mondragón away from Mexico City. He took a job to teach Latin American poetry at the University of Indiana. Margaret Randall stayed in Mexico. Issues 29 to 31, the last ones of the collection, were published because of her perseverance. She wrote over 600 letters to the contributors and friends of El Corno Emplumado asking for their support. She managed to reach, to, sorry, 
she managed to raise money for one more issue. And afterwards, she reached an arrangement with a small independent publishing house called Movimiento Editores that helped with the payment for two more issues. Margaret then was the sole main editor of issue 29 of El Corno Emplumado, where she was assisted by some other few people, including artist Felipe Ehrenberg. Issues 30 and 31 were co-edited with American writer Robert Cohen. Even though Margaret Randall was not alone in the editorship of El Corno, she was there from the beginning to the end, throughout all the seven and a half years that the magazine lasted. For those of you that do not know El Corno Emplumado, it was a bilingual magazine with an average of 2,000 copies per issue that published both canonic and new voices of poetry from all over the American continent. It belonged to a literary and artistic network in a world where human connections were not aided by digital platforms we take for granted today. The poet Ernesto Cardinal referred to this network as the true Pan-American Union. El Corno had over 700 contributors, 20 representatives in 35 countries, and as new research shows, it had over 60 translators. Even though it is true that El Corno was not the only magazine in the 1960s, its value goes beyond the art and the poetry it published. El Corno Emplumado is one of the few artistic bilingual magazines of the era, a magazine that was run by a woman and a man, by an American and a Mexican. Margaret Randall was one of the few women behind the editorship of a literary magazine in Mexico and in Latin America during the 60s. When Margaret co-founded El Corno in 1962, she was very young. She was 25 and a single mother wanting to thrive as a writer in a male-dominated culture. This did not stop her. Her enthusiasm and ambition resulted in a unique bilingual literary magazine. Nowadays, Sergio Mondragon states that the outstanding quality of El Corno relied on Margaret Randall's sense of organization and management. I would add that it also relied on her artistic sensibility and her deep, and her deep sense of justice. In El Corno, Margaret Randall often expressed both statements through her own poems and through her editor's notes, but also with her particular way of editing the magazine. Her editor's notes, notes sorry, in issues 15 to 31 often, often stated political thoughts, for example, on Lyndon Johnson's administration or the Cuban Revolution. But in El Corno, we can also find pieces she chose to publish with a very strong position on international politics without sacrificing artistic qualities, such as the poems of issue 18 written by Algerian women that were held prisoners by the French armed forces during Algeria's independence war in 1962. Also, her love and admiration for the Cuban revolution was often expressed in the magazine, but specifically in issue 23, one of the best issues of the entire magazine collections, of the entire magazine's collection that was dedicated to Cuban poetry and entirely translated to English in an attempt to diminish the cultural blockade the United States government exercised over the island. She wrote a chronicle for that issue that includes some of the answers from interviews with working women, taxi drivers, and students, among others, during the late 60s in Havana. This is a very interesting piece in many aspects. In the first place, this piece is written in the style that Margaret mastered over the years in her books on oral history from the 70s onwards. Secondly, it is one of Margaret's first attempts to pointedly tear apart misconceptions about the island to an American audience, a task she still carries on to this day. If we look at Margaret's papers at UNM, we can find this same piece published in Edge, an American magazine. It would be interesting to compare these two versions and see what similarities and differences exist and in what circles that magazine was read. What we, what we can find in Margaret Randall's papers concerning this period in her life allows us to take a look at what is usually overshadowed by her role as an editor. I am referring to her work as a contributor to other little magazines. 
As some of you may know, El Corno has two archives. One is held at New York University and the other one at the University of Texas at Austin. And both contain letters inviting Margaret to contribute in other magazines, but we cannot read the contributions. The advantage that Margaret Randall's papers offer is that it owns rare magazines from different, part of different parts of the world where Margaret sent pieces from her days in Mexico, where she expressed her perspective on politics and of course, her poetry. To have them gathered in one place is enlightening because we can appreciate on one hand that she was an active part of the network of little magazines spread all over the world, not only as an editor of El Corno, but as a writer and an intellectual. On the other hand, this shows how Margaret acted as a bridge among cultures, especially during these years. Looking through these contributions, we can have a more complete idea of her writings in literary magazines of the time. And perhaps more importantly, we can retrieve real history. I refer here to Margaret's capacity of questioning official narratives. She offers an approach grounded in personal experience and a critical lens through which we can and should relate to history. I have to be honest, I have not been able to visit Margaret's papers at the Center for Southwest Research and Special Collections due to the pandemic. By browsing through the online catalog, we can get an, a general idea of what can be discovered. There is still so much of Margaret's greatness that we do not know yet, and much of it lies silent in the papers held at UNM. It will be the new scholar's pleasure that has been the object of Margaret's generosity, including myself, to voice the archive and share Margaret's labor, which remains to be of great importance to the compulsory re-examination of the history of the world we live in. Thank you. Hi, Gabriela. Thank you. And I'm following Gabriela. Saludos a todos los presentes, familiares, compañeros y amigos. Greetings to my family, library coworkers, and comrades. Can you hear me? I just want to make sure. Liz, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, can you see me? Yes, not right now. Okay. Um, let me just, I'm again a little, okay, there we go. Okay, I'm on. I have been asked to speak today because of my work as one of the processing archivists who set up the Randall manuscript documents and photographs at the University of New Mexico's Center for Southwest Research. <clears throat> today, I have a title for my brief commentary and I wanna share it with you in order to evoke the social justice movements that are currently fighting for our lives and also to frame this discussion about the Margaret Randall collection from a historian archivist point of view. The title I have here today is Archives That Matter for the 21st Century. The Margaret Randall collection is an archive that matters for the 21st century. Now more than ever in the 21st century, we need archives that matter. Historically and to this day, scholars and artists in all fields who search for archives dealing with race, identity, imperialism, and state-sanctioned violence have been involved in a process of disaster recovery. Our cultural workers oftentimes hit brick walls or end up having to be satisfied with an occasional unexpected discovery of a single document buried in a box of archives. And contrary to what people think, archives do not speak to you. The worst mistake we can make is to anthropomorphize archives because archives are man-made, developed within state sanctions edifices and constructed to determine who is considered important in a society and what is worth keeping and who is worth saving. In the archives, all lives do not matter. And those who are erased in the archives are the same groups and communities silenced in the institutions and systems that govern our everyday lives. 
In her most recent memoir, I Never Left Home, Margaret refers to herself as, quote, a builder of bridges, unquote. And the Randall Collection is another example of the beauty and architecture Margaret uses to make sure that voices that are marginalized, hidden, disappeared in the archives, that these voices who speak on behalf of the dispossessed may be recuperated and preserved for our future generations. Because of how important these archives will be to future understandings of historical events, Margaret's social justice work, advocacy, and bridge building with her archival documents will continue long after all of us are sitting here and are gone. In the Randall archive, the list of correspondence embodies the voices of people who need to be heard. These are some of the greatest thinkers of our time who have tried to answer the question of, how do we get out of this imperialistic mess we find ourselves in? Let me speak some of their names found in the correspondence. Huey Newton, Gilles Candabelli, Marge Piercy, Allen Ginsberg, Audrey Lord, Alice Walker, Asada Shakur, Joy Harjo, June Jordan, Annette Kaladny, Daisy Zamora, Jane Norling, Judy Janda, Kathy Bodine, John Nichols, Barrett Price, Alba Vani, Adrian Rich, and last, but definitely not least, Ernesto Cardenal, may he rest in peace and rest in power. The reason we are speaking about Margaret Randall today is because when Margaret hits a brick wall, she builds a bridge. For example, in her 1980 work, Sandino's Daughters, Margaret created a bridge with the oral histories of women revolutionaries in the Sandinista movement. Seeing the erasure and silencing of women, Margaret created archival materials to preserve the memory and experiences of women engaged in groundbreaking revolutionary movements. Further, knowing that memory is a key to storytelling, she went back a second time in Sandino's Daughters Revisited to strengthen this edifice, this bridge, and allow these women to collectively develop more facets of their identities over time as women and as women revolutionaries. That in and of itself is stunningly remarkable and breathtaking in its undertaking. Margaret's photography, photography builds another archival bridge and her photos function as chapter books, books on identities that have been historically left in the dust of patriarchal racial capitalism. In Margaret's photography, she builds narrative bridges between the experiences of subjects and their historical realities. For example, a photo in a cemetery of a simple 19th century tombstone that reads simply nothing else. It says mother and baby. Mother and baby reminds us that this is not only a grave of a nameless woman who died with the baby in childbirth, but it echoes within the historical narratives of women's lack of reproductive safety, freedom and rights, both then and now. And to quote Margaret, quote, the thing about bridges is that they multiply. When you walk across one, another appears, unquote. So too, this can be said of the depth embodied in Margaret's photography, whether it be of the Cuban revolution, Sandinista Comadantes, the lyrical beauty of historic places and spaces, or the experiences of the Randall family over time as a site of a global family that changes, evolves, and grows. The Randall Collection is an example of an archive that matters. I'm getting choked up. It is an example of the kinds of collections that need to be prioritized in the 21st century. State-sanctioned archives need to directly participate in the disaster recovery needed to search and find the voices 
that have been historically marginalized. The Randall Collection is an example of an archive that matters in the 21st century and offers us hope and understanding at this historical moment when restorative justice is desperately needed. Margaret, I thank you for the opportunity to have our paths joined. And I look forward to the next bridge that you will build. Thank you everyone for listening. One love. My warmest thanks to Dr. Liz Hutchinson and to my fellow, fellow panelists and to all the participants joining us today. I'll dive right in. Poet, archivist, excuse me, poet, artist, activist, lesbian, feminist, cultural innovator, and internationalist, Margaret Randall has led a life aligned with decisive moments of cultural and social unrest. New York City, in the late 1950s, Mexico City in the 1960s, revolutionary Cuba from 1969 through 1980, and Sandinista Nicaragua during the early 1980s. With courage, criticality, and self-reflection, she has sought to restore language twisted by our socio-political systems, she, she writes, in order to provide us a dignity that documents and empowers. In her creative and social commitments, in her concern for memory and its vulnerability, the archive of Randall's life in art and action contain embodied evidence of mid to late 20th century intellectual life, US Latin American connectivity. In poetry and print culture, art and photography, translation and other forms of reciprocity. The holdings register involvement in the Americas, especially Cuba and Nicaragua, the struggle for women's rights and gender empowerment, as well as Randall's unique experience of emigration and immigration in the hemisphere. The archive contains documents that tell of her confrontation with post-war US American policies, restrictive of domestic and social life, even as she established networks of art advocacy, political debate, and cultural dissemination. Quote, a moving totality, a breaking down of barriers to provide a showplace for all that is vital and meaningful in contemporary activity, creativity, social involvement, as related to, quote, matters of place, locale, end quote. A moving totality. Those words appear to the editor's notes in the 1966 issue of El Corno Emplumado, the groundbreaking literary magazine that Margaret Randall co-edited with Sergio Mondragon in Mexico City from 1962 to 1969. Today, I'd like to describe a few scenes that connect Margaret's contributions to contemporary thought in her commitment to promoting a form of literacy that aligned print culture, poetry, photography with possible political selfhoods. These identities are rooted in the practical knowledge of displacement, unsettled citizenship, and a style of internationalism like that of the Cuban revolution inclined to forge, I quote her, strong connections between the manual and the intellectual, the arts and the sciences, liberation and culture. In El Corro Emplumado, the reproduction of artworks eventually replaced the strictly typographical composition on the cover to each of the journal's first 14 issues as we're seeing here. The editors had identified a new era for the arts, one that printed in Bauhaus inspired all lowercase font was close to Latin America. I quote from the editor's note, her poets, problems, mystique, while addressing as well the contradictions that inhabited the quote, great empty space between the real positive action on the part of North American youth radicals and creatives and the mass media lie. A black and white image by Mexican cameraman Rodrigo Moya 
featured on the cover of the January 1966 issue of El Corro Emplumado 17. Moya framed the photographic composition to highlight three male youths bearing firearms, backs turned away from the camera with a corner wall serving as a shield as they combat in resistance to the military presence of US Marines on the streets of Santo Domingo. Additionally, that issue's editorial note, a regular feature, related how Randall and Mondragon had returned from a rally in the United States, quote, marching with 30,000 other human beings, artists, housewives, teachers, businessmen, against the madness of the US policy in Vietnam. Later issues of the journal demonstrated a growing solidarity with the Cuban revolution and the country's new directions in art and culture. Issue 26 was devoted to Cuban poetry as Gabriela mentioned and issue 27 featured photographs by Cuban photographer Mario Garcia Goya, Hoya or Mayito of Che and Fidel, Playa Giron and La Habana. Randall recalls that by 1969, El Corno had lost much of its financial support and print shops were scared away from printing the journal. The editors faced, quote, political reprisals and persecution, eventually forcing Margaret into hiding in the middle of 1969 and eventually out of Mexico to Cuba that year, an episode recounted in her various life accounts, including her memoir, I Never Left Home. In this context, Randall's archive suggests some through lines for research into her own dual practice as writer and photographer. In light of El Corno Emplumado's commitment to poetry as a transmittable force and vehicle for communication, hemispheric and international in scope. Enhancing the journal's critique of US imperialism, its mass, its mass media skepticism in the context of the Vietnam War, Mexico's student movement and the trauma of Tlatelolco, and Randall's papers and voluminous correspondence with artists and writers during her experience of the Cuban revolution from 1969 and 1980 and after are linked together. In the last two years of her years in Cuba, Randall apprenticed with Cuban photographer Ramon Martinez Grandal. Even as the archive appears to contain no papers related to Cuban photography, it bears to read the images she produced then in light of a concurrent 1978 exhibition and colloquium that the Consejo Mexicano de Fotografía organized in Mexico City. La primera muestra de fotografía latinoamericana contemporánea hecho en, Me eh, hecho en América Latina. In its publications, the Consejo Me Mexicano expressed the energies and attitudes defining tenets of what Idelber Avelar has specified as the dynamic connecting modernization and the prospect of US imperial encroachment to the aesthetic drive of Latin Americanism. Under the mentorship of Martinez Grandal, Margaret viewed photography, as did the Consejo Mexicano innovators, as an accountability compelled to interpret with images the beauty, conflict, triumph, defeat, and longing of a people. And to, quote, aspire accordingly to produce an unambiguous and committed art. This is from their convocatoria. Of her desire to learn photography, Randall has described her visual practice as linked to, quote, a search for language that was neither English, my native tongue, which during my years in Latin America, I could rarely share with those closest to me, or Spanish, a language I spoke with family and friends, but in which I had never been able to write poetry, end quote. Randall's Cuban photographs serve the artist as a form of alternate speech, the idiom, and, the idiom as action, and a surrogate homeland. Claims confirmed by poems in Randall's 1978 collection, Carlota, Prose and Poetry from Havana. Topically, the photographs in the University of New Mexico collection reflect occasions of public affirmation in socialist public space, including marches in support of the revolution, images of military training, but also of parades, performances, poetry readings, and festivals. Closer inspection of the proof sheets and prints that correspond to negatives from our Cuban photographs provide insight into the makeshift conditions for producing negatives and developing prints, material circumstances that defined the era's visual aesthetic. As Margaret has written, quote, in the Cuba of those years, 
There were no stores where you could buy packets of powders you could mix with water to produce developer, stop bath, or fixer. We mixed our own from the chemicals we'd get at compound pharmacies when you could get them, end quote. Images like the one we're looking at, Girl with Shoes, Alamar, Havana, 1978, contain what Randall sought in a photograph, quote, the seen and the unseen, the girl on whom I focused and the little boy walking behind her who I didn't notice until I took the print from the developing tray. Others, like mother and son Havana sidewalk, reveal Randall's eye for depicting the everyday heroics, especially for women and children, parallel to such poems as motherhood, which trace the maternal as the unacknowledged reason of history that's published in Carlota. Still others, as though in reply to Raul Corrales' iconic picture of a young rebel soldier asleep on a cot in the elegant home of a bourgeois family that had abandoned the island, I'm quoting Margaret, an admitted reference point for Randall, constitute a series of interior views into the private realm and the national vernacular from the perspective of the street level passerby. It stands as well to upstream these portraits of Cuban daily life from a feminist perspective into the 1980s and 1990s alongside Randall's correspondence with artists and writers, Dion Brand, Lorna de Cervantes, Michelle Cliff, Elaine de Kooning, Diane de Prima, Carolyn Forche, Joy Harjo, Hetty Jones, June Jordan, Barbara Kingslover, Lucy Lepard, Audre Lorde, Holly Near, Jay Norling, Lynn Tillman, Alice Walker. Similarly, Randall's portraits of artists and writers associated with Naropa University's summer writing program, where she has long served as faculty, provide insight into poems from her 19, excuse me, from her 2019 collection Against Atrocity. That is, through the lines that compel a promissory insistence of what tenacity, determination, and clarity can yield, uh, a style of hope in artistic community and sociability. What Randall specifies as art, making place, and holding time in a history written as we carry on. Photography, no doubt, has structured Margaret Randall's understanding of time at once tethered to community, to the poetic imagination, to the collective process of history, and to the long duration of geological dispersion. In her collection, More Than Things, Randall wonders, is time a mere organizing principle or can we reconceptualize it so that it will not drag us down to our doom? And how may we restore memory to image in order to reclaim a self that empowers?" End quote. The poet photographer has posed similar questions in the irrevocable light of climate crisis and the impermanence of human life ways, the uneven death dealing distributions of modern civilization with such massacres and destruction that haunt history and so possess the author of Stone Witness of 2007 to reflect on the inconsequence of self when confronting the ancestral Pueblo and sites of Chaco, Cliff Palace, Keat Seal. She, she writes, without time, does timelessness exist? Those poems can be read alongside the sobering view of Depeche Chacabarti that, that climate crisis has destabilized the quote, age-old humanist distinction between natural history and human history, pointing to a figure of the universal that escapes our capacity to experience the world as anything other than a shared sense of catastrophe." End quote. Randall's poetic line goes the step further to perform what the lens cannot capture, Earth's surface, cultural survival in relation to configurations of mind as a place emptied of boundaries, the future cut off from the present in language as sediment, she writes, water flowing from the rock, then trickling from the rock and finally only dripping from the rock. A smile, a grimace, pain. Colors, who painted them, what they mean, chiseled lines, who carved the rocks anyway, endorphins, other species, a new taste, inexplicable sadness, loss, renewal, power and empowerment. At the height of her prodigious powers, Margaret Randall has crowned a lifelong commitment to art and activism with an astounding body of work, much of it written in the last 20 years. Using her camera lens as a tool for erasing distance, the photographic instant is meant to resemble the leap over the interrogation mark, 
that mistakes, that makes visible the contradictions of a society's stated aims by way of, quote, the things that remind us of where we have been, present even as the words begin to fade, end quote. Margaret Randall continues to extend the foundational work inaugurated with the literary journal El Corno Emplumado, devoting energies to translation and advocacy, poetry and photography, to leap the interrogation mark, so to speak, that so determines the loss and renewals of power and empowerment. Thank you. Hello everyone, saludos. My name is Naomi Ambris. I'm a PhD student in American Studies at the University of New Mexico. I first heard of Margaret Randall during my undergrad years when I came across her book, Women of Cuba. I love the testimonies in Randall's generous, generous and beautiful documentation of Cuban women. When I was accepted to my graduate program at the University of New Mexico, I knew that I wanted to include the Margaret Randall archives in my research. During my first semester of graduate school, our final assignment required me to go into the archives. For this assignment, I looked at the Margaret Randall papers in particular, her correspondence between her dear activist friend, Audre Lorde. When the boxes were brought out to me, I learned that Randall's collection contained years of correspondence, film, photographs of Randall's life, and influences in feminist activists and writer circles in Latin America and the US. It was through her archives that I got the first glimpse and learned a little more about her life. I knew that I had uh, studied, uh, I knew that she had studied at the University of New Mexico and that she left for Europe and then moved to Mexico. She began working as an oral historian and photographer that took her traveling throughout Mexico, Cuba, Chile, Nicaragua, and Peru, thus devoting the majority of her time in Cuba. She later returned to Albuquerque, New Mexico to lecture in the Women's Studies and American Studies programs, my home department at the University of New Mexico. The Audre Lorde folder contains handwritten and typed letters between Randall and Lorde that span more than a decade. These documents range from topics about her, their personal lives to details about teaching and feminist reading and writing groups during the late 1970s through the 90s. The document that captivated me the most was the type essay delivered in December 1992 by Randall. This essay was a tribute to Lord a month after her passing in November that same year. Randall's words capture her sadness yet optimism. Moreover, Randall's vivid narrative of her response to Lord's death feels like she's addressing Lord in person. For example, the first sentence of her, the document addresses Lord directly. Randall states, quote, Audrey, everything seems more fragile since you're gone. It was what you said and how you made sure you filled each diminishing breath in a way that would be useful to us all. Such a rare and powerful legacy, end quote. Here, Randall is admiring Lord's words, thoughts, and legacy. In her second paragraph, Randall mentions Lord's death and her emotional response to it. She notes, quote, when you died, my first emotion was almost one of relief. Such an arduous battle, so many days and weeks and months of suffering. If I truly sat with it, the loss seemed overwhelming. But I chose to envision you at peace. Then too, the poems and essays reassured me they remain to comfort and go on to teaching." End quote. In this paragraph, Randall's words are genuine and heartfelt. Lord had been battling cancer for many years and throughout this battle, she kept her activism and friendship at the center of her struggles. Thus, 
Randolph's emotional response has a sense of peace and the acceptance of loss of a dear friend and comrade. In the third and last paragraph, Randall tells Lord her reflections and feelings on a film she and her partner had recently watched at the theater. This film was based on another famous political activist, Minister Malcolm X. She states, quote, Barbara and I saw the film and left the theater in kind of a daze, unwilling even to voice criticism of one aspect or another. We were too busy with the texture and meaning of an era and a man that helped shape who we are. And that's when I began to understand what happens when great teachers are taken from us by bullets or cancer, whatever the enemy hones to murder the best among us. The intention of this essay was to honor and capture Lord's spirit as a true testament to her contributions and legacy. In the spring of 2018, I wrote my second paper uh, of, titled In the Struggle for Voice, Equality and Justice, Recovering the Margaret Randall Archives. In this paper, I showed the ways the US government has jeopardized, intimidated and challenged citizenship based on an individual's affiliation by focusing on the Margaret Randall's immigration case. I have such a great admiration for Randall, not only for the years of activism and service, but for believing and fighting for what is right. Though being born in the United States, the Immigration and National, uh, Nationality Act of 1952, also known as the McCarran-Walter Act, challenged Randall's citizenship due to her involvement with communist countries. After three years of trial in federal courts, Randall's case was ap appealed and she was granted back her US citizenship. Randall's immigration co court folder once again contained correspondence in support of her service and work from people near and afar. This documentation validates not only what she meant to many people, but the importance of her service and work that meant to many others. It also proves to the resiliency of solidarity work that challenges hegemonic structures. The summer of 2016, I was awarded the Latin American Institute Summer Research Grant to go to Casa de las Americas in La Habana, Cuba, the very place Randall helped initiate. It was Randall's books and testimonies in her archives that compelled me to go to Cuba in the first place. Having access written, handwritten letters and documents by important feminist figures reminds me of the long feminist struggle for equality and social justice that is still alive and continuing. As I work on my research on bridging the connections between Afro-descendants and mestizo identities in the US Southwest, Mexico and Cuba, I find Randall's work not, uh, as not only a special collection, which have influenced and fueled my own interests, but as an example of how oral histories and testimonies continue to give voice to the unheard and help bridge the struggles for justice and equality for a most, more just world across physical and imaginary borders. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me get everything shared. Okay. I'm delighted to be here today at the symposium in honor of Margaret Randall and her work. I'm an associate professor at the University of Rhode Island, and I study women's transnational social movements in the late 20th century. My intention for this brief talk is twofold. First, to place Randall's work within the larger context of transnational solidarity, particularly in the 1960s and 1970s. And second, to highlight the contributions of her papers and other collections available at the Center for Southwest Research to such analyses. I aim to undertake these two tasks simultaneously. In 2012, I visited the archives at the Center for Southwest Research at the University of New Mexico to conduct research for my dissertation project. 
I had de decided to study American women's transnational solidarity work, particularly their anti-war activism during the US war in Vietnam in the 1960s and 1970s. And a couple of years before that, I had discovered Margaret Randall's work on Cuban and Nicaraguan women. And as I began my dissertation research, I came across her Spirit of the People, which is about her 1974 visit to North Vietnam. So this was after US troops had left, left South Vietnam, but before the fall of Saigon in the spring of 1975. And I wanted to know more about her trip. Thus, I visited UNM with the particular intention of going through Randall's papers. And I also planned to look through some of the radical pamphlets, underground newspapers, and other collections housed at the center in order to learn more about anti-war and women's activism in the Southwest, including the anti-war activism of Mexican Americans and Chicanas in particular. What I discovered by looking through the collections at the CSWR was the significance of transnational connections between activists and artists and women and feminists across the Americas. In particular, Randall's story and the CSWR archives document the significant amount of attention that various groups pay to revolutionary societies, particularly to Cuba. Randall moved to Cuba in 1969, as others have established, placing her front and center to witness and analyze the revolution there. Like many artists and activists of her generation, Randall writes in her 2009 memoir, To Change the World, that the Cuban Revolution of 1959 struck her like a lightning bolt and she felt drawn towards it. Beginning in the early 1960s, dozens of US citizens traveled to Cuba to observe life under Castro. And by the late 1960s, organized efforts through the Vince Ramos, the We Shall Overcome Brigade brought hundreds of US Americans primarily youths and activists with anti-imperialist, anti-war and black power connections to Cuba to participate in various agricultural and construction projects in efforts to forward the revolution. Harvesting sugarcane was what they most often did. While in Cuba, US Americans learned more about socialism and Cuban society and brought back to the United States stories and ideas about how to implement some of the policies and practices in their communities in the US. It's important to note that some of these activists who often self-identified as revolutionaries and anti-imperialists did not travel to Cuba. Some also did not only travel to Cuba, some also visited communist China, North Korea, and North Vietnam, for instance. But with Cuba being closer to the United States, more US Americans were able to visit Cuba than many of the other countries. And just as a side note, the US State Department restricted or forbade travel to all of these countries at the time. So it wasn't that easy to get to any of them. When it came to visiting Cuba, China, North Korea, or North Vietnam, one of the central questions in feminist circles was how women's rights might be advanced under socialism and after revolution. And this was often analyzed in contrast to women's limited rights under capitalism. During a 2012 interview with me, Randall recalled being, quote, hit between the eyes, end quote, by feminism when she read work by prominent women's rights thinkers while living in Mexico in the late 1960s. After she moved to Cuba, she took the opportunity to conduct interviews with Cuban women about their day-to-day -day lives under the revolutionary government. Randall wanted to find out, quote, how socialism might begin to alter the sexual balance of power, end quote. She already knew many of the ways women had achieved equality or were working toward equality with men. Education, healthcare, and employment opportunities all pointed toward women's rights gains. Yet, Randall observed that women maintained beauty and fashion standards that feminists in the United States had tossed aside, and she discerned that the state-supported national women's organization, the Federation of Cuban Women, perceived feminism to be an imported ideology that could hinder class solidarity. Randall published Cuban Women Now based on her research in the early 1970s, and she continued to pay attention to Cuban women's lives in the post-revolutionary society. In a 1975 article, she commented that while women had gained equality in many realms, access to the job market, equal educational opportunities, and equal pay for equal work, they had yet to overcome cultural barriers that maintain women's responsibilities as caretaker of the family and that sexually objectified women's bodies. Randall's study of Cuban women's lives is a singular, but not the sole example of the ways in which North American and European feminists look to revolutionary context to find out how women could best achieve liberation. Hundreds of women from North America and Europe traveled to Cuba, North Vietnam, North Korea, and China to discover whether and in what ways women's liberation accompanied national liberation. And hundreds of images of revolutionary womanhood represented by Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, and Cuban women proliferated in underground press. 
And this is one rather iconic image of revolutionary womanhood that Vietnamese women came to represent for feminists in North America in Europe. <clears throat> Those who migrated to or visited decolonizing nations to witness developments in women's rights held their breath as they waited to see just how far reaching the revolution would truly be. And Randall's work and analysis contributed to these transnational feminist discussions and her papers and other material at the CSWR offer a window onto this debate and discourse, especially in terms of analyses of post-revolutionary Cuban society. One last contribution that I'm going to mention during this brief talk that the papers at the CSWR made to my research and that Randall's life story speaks to is the transnational nature of anti-Vietnam War activism. In Randall's papers, I discovered this newspaper, Vietnam del Sur Bencera, South Vietnam Will Win. This is a National Liberation Front, otherwise known as the Viet Cong, publication printed in Cuba. While I had known that North Vietnam had produced multilingual anti-war publications, most commonly in French and English for consumption abroad. This was the first Spanish language newspaper I had come across and the first one printed in the Americas. Usually they were printed in Hanoi and sent abroad. What this newspaper shows is that North Vietnamese officials extended their efforts to create a transnational anti-war movement beyond US citizens who ostensibly could stop the US war by voting in anti-war politicians and beyond former colonial officials in France who arguably held some sway over Washington to encompass a larger body of the world's population, including those who were working toward their own socialist societies. Randall had a role to play in this transnational anti-Vietnam War activism as a visitor to North Vietnam in 1974, and also as an English language tutor to a Vietnamese quote unquote comrade, to use her word, who participated in the Voice of Vietnam Radio in Havana. The Voice of Vietnam Radio could blast the North Vietnamese perspective on the US war in Vietnam to the southern shores of the United States likely in hopes of converting more US citizens to oppose US intervention in Vietnam. Thus Randall's papers and other collections at the CSWR provide evidence of the transnational and multi-layered nature of anti-Vietnam War activism. I recently returned to replications of documents I collected from Margaret Randall's papers at the Center for Southwest Research at UNM, as well as to an interview I conducted with her in her home in January 2012 for a chapter I'm writing about women's transnational solidarity for an edited collection. Her story, while unique, points to and embodies some of the larger questions and debates of the era. And her papers and the other collections at the center also ask and suggest answers to recurring questions, large and small. Questions about feminism, decolonization, revolution, and society. There are certainly no easy answers or solutions, but Randall's papers and the other collections of the CSWR allow us to explore thoughts and ideas that continue to shape our perceptions today. Thank you. Hello, we are trying to all get back in our virtual room together. Um, thank you to our over 150 attendees to the panel. Um, I'd like to invite those of you watching to please enter any que questions that you have for the panelists in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom page. Um, we have a little bit of time for discussion. And so before we turn to audience questions, I'd like to quickly ask if any of our panelists um, would like, like to ask questions of each other or to elaborate on something that um, you forgot to say in presenting your uh, wonderful insights into Margaret's work. I mean, I might ask Jessica, this is, thank you for all your talks. And I, I, I was reminded also reading, I hadn't read Liz, your interview with, um, with Margaret until yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinating and, and really important um, life accounts and political accounts that she shares there. And Jessica, what your talk reminds me of is just the materiality of some of these papers that speak to, I think one of the, one of the key points that you get to Liz in your interview with uh, with Margaret, which is the idea to which there was resistance to feminism in definitely in Cuba and in other parts of Latin America. And yet it's that I just can't help but be, be drawn to that 
um, poster that said Margaret Randall and the campaign against sexism in Cuba, right? Um, maybe you could just say a little bit more about that if, you, if there are other findings about this kind of resistance, because it is particular to, I think, to Margaret's um, particular kind of act, feminist activism. Sure, yeah. Um, um, sorry, I'm also looking at the chat. <laughs> Um, so there, there were a few, few findings in her papers and, you know, I just showed a couple of the kind of the pam the advertisements of these talks that she was giving. They were in mostly primarily in the late 1970s or uh, mid 1970s that she came back to the United States and was doing these talks that was, and I, what I found was it was more geared toward U.S. audiences where, you know, U.S. feminists were so looking at women abroad and in some ways doing so or in many ways doing so in a very flat way um, where it was just oh they have everything perfect in Cuba in North Vietnam in China everything is perfect there they have no problems and so I think what you can see through Margaret's work and through other people who were able to actually spend real time but Margaret is one of the very rare people who were actually able to spend so many years in Cuba and in these other places and then able to kind of um, resist that narrative of everything in, in Cuba is wonderful now for women. Um, all of their problems are solved. So I think it is a very important contribution that her papers make and that her story makes is, is that kind of a, a unveiling of the, of the sexism behind what is normally shown or what had been shown. I mean, the other thing that's interesting that, that perhaps gets eclipsed by Margaret's multi- talents and multidisciplinary approach is that I think one of the threads that really unites all her work is really she's an ethnographer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's a kind of ethnographic drive. It's certainly in, in Naomi and, and Gabriela and Barbara, the way you were looking at the way in which she's either thinking about community or friendship is all about the kind of the oral um, testimony about these about these relationships. So maybe some of you might respond to that in some kind of way. It's, it's very striking to me. I can I can actually answer that because that's Perfect. exactly how I read her first book and that's why I looked at her archives to to think about my own oral histories and how I wanted to to say those narratives and give voice to these people in the way that did justice right so I, I, Mar I look at Margaret uh, Margaret's work for that particular reason absolutely yeah it's almost as if even friendships um can be imperiled to disappearance, right? And I think this comes from kind of historical, living historical trauma. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Do we have other questions for each other or shall we go to ones that are starting to come in? And then I have one in my back pocket. <laughs> uh, one of our audience members is asking, uh, Gabriela, if your written work is avail on uh, Margaret is available to the public where people could find that. I'm going to paste on the chat a link where you can get to read my master thesis on El Corno Emplumado. And the other articles I have written are in books that were published here in Mexico and aren't available online. But um, if you can get to me your emails, I can send it to you without a problem. Thank you. Um, there seems to be more interest in this question of uh, feminism uh, as it uh, manifests both in Margaret's life and in uh, this work uh, she did in so many different places. Uh, one such question is whether the feminist uh, resistance in Cuba is due to particular uh, social hierarchical cultural system. If so, what is it? How do we how do we explain that? Is that something that people have been able to engage in through Margaret's work. It's a big question. Uh, perhaps if we've stumped our panelists, we could ask uh, Margaret for an opinion on that. <laughs> Meanwhile, if others have questions, if you put them in the Q&A, that would be great. 
Could you unmute me and I'll address that question if none of the panelists want to? You are unmuted. Please uh, go right ahead. We would like to see you though. Yes, I need to be uh, un, uh, uninvisibilized as well. <laughs> there you are. Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a really interesting question, and I noticed that it's come that some form of it has come in the Q and A and in the chat from various people um, about uh, the attitude, explaining the attitude of the Cuban party with regard to feminism and how that's evolved over the years. When I first lived in Cuba, um, feminism was really a dirty word, and uh, the Cuban party generally followed the international communist. Um, sense that uh, the main contradiction in society was the class contradiction. Once that was taken care of, everything else would follow, such as, um, you know, issues of gender, race, and so forth. Um, and so um, feminists were looked upon uh, uh, quite, <laughs> they were looked upon askance in Cuba at that time, and I was one of those feminists. So. Um, I suffered that uh, along with a number of other people. Um, the, uh, it was complicated because as you know, Cuba for more than 60 years has suffered a terrible embargo from the United States. It's um, it suffered all kinds of covert and overt attacks. And it's this little tiny country, island country at uh, 90 miles off our shores. So, uh, it was important and it continues to be important for the Cubans to have a unity, a unified population from which to struggle against uh, this threat from the North. And I think that uh, the Cuban hierarchy has long said, um, well, you know, if uh, feminism is gonna split the, the, the ruling class, split men and women, it really comes from a lack of understanding of what feminism is. Um, so on the one hand, I understood that need for unity. On the other hand, um, I think it's it's very much um, an excuse. You know, it's an ex it's a patriarchal excuse uh, to not look at issues of gender, uh, which are so important in society. It would be so important for Cuba to be able to make a gender analysis of society. And I should say that that gender analysis has been made by a number of Cuban women, the Mahin women in the 90s and so forth. But um, it's still, it's, there's still a long way to go around that issue in Cuba. On the other hand, the things that the Cuban revolution has done for women are extraordinary. So it's a mixed bag. And, and of course, there's not enough time to address it here. I do want to say that I think things are changing for the better. Okay, thank you so much, Margaret. When, when in doubt, we turn, we turn to you, as you know. Um, I thought uh, we could take a question here which has to do with uh, the broader context of uh, Margaret's uh, poetry and her work. Um, and one uh, panelist has, participant has asked us, it's not surprising that uh, the panelists who are specialists in domains inhabited by Margaret are of course very familiar with Margaret and with her work. Um, and this uh, author is very familiar as a poet and a poetry event host, having hosted Margaret and many other poets at Albuquerque events. Thank you, Billy, for that. How familiar is the general public with Margaret's important work and views and what is being done to increase this familiarity? Um, maybe that's something uh, our panelists could address either from the perspective of graduate studies uh, and their own trajectories or the work that they've uh, conducted with the Margaret Randall Archive and her work over the course of their longer careers. Well, maybe I could just briefly speak to some very recent interests, not only in El Corno Emplumado, but also in Margaret's work. But I would point readers to uh, Harris Feinsod and his scholarship and the work that he's done with John Cutler Alba at what is called the Open Door Archive at Northwestern, which has the complete El Corno Plumado digitized with mm -hmm. ephemera and commentary by Margaret and others who are, uh, including for example, some very interesting comments by uh, Felipe Ehrenberg, who sadly passed away recently, so that you get a sense of that life world uh, of around the journal. Um, maybe Margaret might have something to say about this, but I have a feeling that if you've lived outside of the United States, I think that um, on the map that tends to be so domestic in many, many ways, 
one can get left out of certain kinds of visibility. But I think Margaret's work is so directly tied to avant-garde practices like Black Mountain and the beat poets uh, uh, of California. And you see it in the in the um, index and the table of content of the of the issues of El Corno Plumado. As a matter of fact, you could just look at the table of contents of the 31 issues and, and just looking at the North American um, contributors, get a sense of a map uh, of the many geographies of, of US American poetry. Great. Other, other thoughts? Yes, I yes, know. Well, I think that Margaret's works are uh, were ahead of her time. I think that Margaret was really an advanced intellectual. And, and for example, here in Mexico, I have seen during the past six years that I've been working with El Corno, uh, a lot of growing interest in her work. And I see this interest um, related to interest in feminism that wasn't the same six years ago that, that is now. And I think that every time people are more are growing more interested in her work. Also, um, her view on, well, yeah, her view on feminism, I think that's the most, um, the most important uh, part that is being, I'm sorry, but my English isn't so good. So uh, I'm sorry. But <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that Margaret Randall here in Mexico is uh, being more recognized if, with every year we have more interest. And I agree with Roberto uh, that the, the Open Door Archive has made a really huge difference in that, especially because people are getting to know El Corno more and more. And getting to know El Corno also leads to getting to know Margaret Randall. So that's it. That's I would like I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, Jaconda. I was just going to say briefly that I also think that there it's a, it's the it's the dilemma of someone who is multidisciplinary is often a, sort of that mob that mobility makes it difficult to um, describe, pin down. And the only other thing I would add to what you just said, Gabby, I think it's excellent, is I think there's a growing interest also because of El Corno in Latin America and the United States for of DI, DIY publications, yeah. zines, the little magazine again, The Handmaid, um, and so forth. Gioconda, por favor. Well, what I wanted to say was that uh, I think for Latin America, Margaret is a classic. You know, it's a person who has a jo a united so many expressions and you know her photography she's all over the place in latin america and many books i mean we women in, that were in uh, struggles and fought for our freedom uh, we really looked at margaret and thought of margaret as one of the precursors of all our struggles and also a person who left so much of herself you know in our own history so I think, you know, of course, the visibility of women, we are all made invisible in many cultures and it's, it's a struggle to make, a, to keep reminding people of the contribution of women to whatever culture and especially in Latin America. But I think that has been changing. And among women, I think Margaret, as I said, is a classic and it's a person who has incredible respect and everybody, you know, even, you know, when I was going to come and participate with her, I told a few people and they were, wow, Margaret Randall, you're going to talk to her. And, you know, so there is a, this uh, worship in many people of what Margaret uh, contributed to our knowledge of ourselves. You know, all her books about the Sandinista women, for example, were I think they are the historical record of what we did. I think there is no historical record in Nicaragua to, to speak of, of women in particular, or what was their contribution, you know? And now, in, because Daniel Ortega has completely screwed up our country, so we are now in this situation where Sandinismo has become 
a bad word, you know, in Nicaragua. And so it's really important to think that this is a work, a body of work that is going to remain and that is going to, to, uh, to say what uh, this testimony of what women's participation meant in Nicaragua, in Cuba, in all these countries. You know? Thank you, Chikonda. I think um, I have never been so happily Zoom bombed as uh, this full uh, page of, of wonderful contributors. And you've also gotten a, a taste of what this afternoon's, this evening's session should bring um, in the delightful conversation between Margaret and Gioconda. So I invite you to come back uh, for that. I wanted to uh, uh, turn our attention to a couple of the questions about archives in particular. Um, here's something where I thought, uh, Barbara, you might have a, a sense. Um, one audience member would like to know how many of Margaret Randall's archives exist besides the one at UNM, uh, what is the sort of exclusivity or not of uh, where her, her materials are held? This is something you and I have talked about. Um, okay, that's like a, a loaded five barreled question. So Sorry. I know that's okay. I, I, I haven't been able to read where it is. Um, you know, I'm not, I think we'd have to ask Margaret where everything's being held. I mean, in terms, yeah, because some um, somebody mentioned um, that was speaking, maybe Roberto, I don't know if it was you or Gabriela, but um, it was about um, the fact that there's a full run of stuff at Austin and also, um, where was the other place? There was another- New York University. Right, and then um, I think Jessica also found other archives. I do not, know the full where the full corpus is located i'm really familiar with what we have in our mm -hmm. um uh holdings because i've touched them and worked with them and put them together but um on the other issue of exclusivity what is that again no that was the same question whether we've oh. archives elsewhere um, I know Margaret has uh, part of an answer here because she knows where her material. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and I know that the vast majority of them are here. Is that right, Margaret? That's absolutely right. Yes, there are a few things at Princeton, very, very few. Uh, there, um, some of the early El Cordino, uh materials are at New York University. Uh, and of course, there's uh, quite a bit of, of, of material at Austin, but the vast, vast, vast majority of, um, of my archives, both literary and personal and uh, photographic, reside at the University of New Mexico. Um, I, in terms of exclusivity, um, all of my archives are open to the public with the exception of my journals, which uh, will not be open until I've been dead for 30 years. I didn't want to face the music, but, <laughs> but all the rest of it is, is open. Uh, and I just want to say to Ishikonda, um, I've been trying to figure out how to do that on the ch chat, that um, you all and the women in, in Nicaragua, the women in Latin America, uh, many of the men as well, gave me so much more than I have ever been able to give you. Uh, it certainly is a two-way street. Uh, uh, it, I mean, I feel that I've just been so extraordinarily fortunate in my life to have lived among you and learned from you. And, um, you know, I can't say that enough. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be on the screen in, in about a half an hour, so I won't go any further. I wanted to bring up something mutual, too. Mutual. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. you're the best. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to bring up something also, there's a, um, uh, about the archive. Um, Margaret, the Kathy Bodine correspondence was also, I think. Yes, yes. What do we say, restricted? Yes. So Kathy Bodine was with the weather, weather people let's call them the weather people and the weather men. And uh, they basically, uh, I think you and Kathy had like a huge correspondence uh, over 12 years, I think, when she was up in uh, prison up there in uh, Canada area or up north. Oh, no, she was in prison in New York and New York. I visited her every week for many right. years. And we've had a, a close friendship for over 20 years. Um, 
she's been out of prison now for a number mm -hmm. of years. Uh, mm -hmm. That that correspondence is also limited or restricted because mm -hmm. um, when I um, uh, when I deposited that uh, part of my archive at the university, um, I didn't want to in any way do anything that would hinder her. Um, right. ability to uh, leave prison. She was there for 22 years. So right. um, that may be revised later, but um, right. yeah, almost everything is available. And there's another thing too that I want to bring up. Um, the um, uh, um, There's 37 binders that Margaret gave us when that Margaret put together and initially I had this in my talk, but then I had to take it out because, you know, four pages, that's so tiny <laughs> and I'm so verbose. But um, the 37 binders um, are, were done by Margaret. They were done, Roberto, I was thinking about you when you were doing this about the, the photography. Oh my God, I just love what you said. It like so cool because I like stared at that stuff for a year and I was like, oh my God in heaven. So anyway, the thing is, is that um, the uh, 37 binders, that is very important because those are done by Margaret. She set them up in a, uh, in a narrative structure underneath a category. And those reflect, you know, um, her thinking about what was important in these categories. So me and Cindy, Cindy and I, oh God, um, Cindy and I, are basically going to reduplicate the way, put it into archival preservation uh, format and then reduplicate how you did them. I think those are really important for people working with your photography. And I wanna say another thing too about there, your photography. Can I ask a question, Barbara? Yeah. Are, those, are those the um, binders? Are you referring to the binders mm -hmm. of my family trips? Yeah, those were, were they all family stuff? Yeah, it's all, okay. it's, they were photograph albums, which yeah. uh, packed, it, they, they went halfway to the ceiling. Uh, and yes. we moved about a year ago and, um, you know, had to just um, divest of so many things for, for reasons of space, we moved to a very tiny condo. And so those are all uh, family trips. Um, okay. And um, of course they're my photography, but they're not meant to be, um, you know, art photography, if you want to make that distinction. No, that's cool. Yeah. I'm not trying to make that point, but I am saying that it's, it's your thinking that went into how they were constructed. Because I'm the person who put together the photos. And yeah, sure, I can put a bunch of photos into Cuba. I can put a bunch of photos into Sandinistas and Nicaragua and this and that. And, and um, you know, uh, geography and landscape. But you're the person who put those together. I just think it's important as an archivist. Mm -hmm. to think that well, way. I, yeah. I remember our conversations, Barbara, as Good. being so priv privileged for me when you were working on that. Um, oh. you, would, you would uh, mail me, email me every <laughs> several times a week and, you know, send me um, strip sheets, um, negatives, uh, you know, contact sheets of negatives. And I would try to identify these people in Nicaragua and Cuba and different parts of the world. And, mm -hmm. um, it's good. It's a good thing that we had those conversations several years ago because uh, I'm not sure I would be able to remember so many of the people today. Hey, I can't remember right now, but you know, I have to tell you, like I was um, telling somebody about you, and you would like uh, respond back to me. I was saying it was really interesting how how you would remember things, how you would like, because memory is so important when you talk about archives, and then actually, you know, to have a human being that, whose archives. I worked on that I can actually talk to, like that is such a gift to me. And then to see your kids, I know some of them are on here, I gotta say this, um, you know, you meet people in the archives and you never once hear their, I met so many people like Giaconda, you I met in the archives and to see you talk and to see you move and your animated person, that just makes me like my heart, like it makes me so happy. And I feel like I know Margaret's family and I don't, I've never met them. I would know them on the street though, yeah. you know, because I see them so much. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. The, the sort of living engagement with the archive is part of what I think we're trying to communicate here. And along those lines, I'd like to 
ask a broad question, um, hoping that Naomi or, or Jessica might pick this up um, as to what might be one of the most surprising or sort of beloved elements you discovered in your quest or your encounter with the archives. Um, you mentioned some of them in each of your talks, but I know you didn't have time uh, to really go on and on. So I wonder if there's um, something else you might want to tell uh, everyone is in these, in these materials that you found revelatory or, or exciting. I guess I can go first. Yeah, please. Um, I actually looked at the archives in 2015, started to look at her archives. They were not as wonderfully archived <laughs> as they are now. So thank, I wanna also thank you, Liz, for making this happen, and Barbara. Um, I was just, at that time, you know, I'm not only new to, to UNM and new, knowing the Margaret's archives, but when uh, I think even the people in the Southwest and the library didn't know there were th these many boxes. <laughs> um, so it was kind of, I was there and uh, it was really neat to just kind of actually touch them and, and see them firsthand. Um, that was something that was really captivated me. And also, again, you know, it was, it was reading her folders and her conversations with many people, not just in the United States, but all over the world that were responding to her on this personal level. Again, you know, I was looking at more of the oral history that that in, um, were there. Um, so for me, it's uh, definitely influenced my research and the way that I, what I conduct my own research. So, yeah. Naomi, can I ask a question? Yes. Because I'm, I'm fascinated with the relationship between Margaret and Audre Lorde. Mm -hmm. Because I see now I'm understanding Audre Lorde to be also an, an internationalist in a similar way because this summer the lectures that Audre Lorde gave in Berlin appeared in mm -hmm. print. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you saw any connections of that in the correspondence of that internationalism. Oh, absolutely. And not only, I mean, I, I was not, I, for the or talk here, I, I shortened my, my presentation, but okay. I also, you know, uh, quoted Audrey Rich and all these women that I looked up to and, you know, just I've read and, you know, for 10 plus years and was exposed to in books and, and reading, but never really to actually feel and, and see the handwritten, you know, papers from, from this correspondence definitely um, were there. Um, she, uh, I think that folder with Audrey Lord, they were, I can't recall right now, it's 2015, five years ago that I saw them, but there were, it was a complete folder of their correspondence for a decade, like I mentioned. So yes, absolutely. Um, what you mentioned, international solidarity, sisterhood. Right, yes. that's great, thank you. Any other discoveries or favorite tales from the archive? No, it's quiet. Then I do have one from an, from an audience member here. Um, uh, this might pertain to a couple of the presentations. What are the current digital equivalents of literary magazines like El Corno that you think follow in the footsteps of that magazine's legacy today, bilingual, transnational, and so forth? Our Corno experts here want to respond. Yes. Um, well, there are a lot of magazines that uh, took inspiration in El Corno Emplumado. Um, in Mexico City, we have several from the 70s. Um, I can think of uh, maybe Femme magazine that was a feminist magazine uh, during the 70s run by women. Um, but there are also a new, new magazines that are digital that take their inspiration directly from El Corno with this view of internationalism, like Roberto was saying. Um, I can think of Pagina Salmon is one of them that is run by a Mexican, a Mexican student. And also, I don't remember the name, but there is another one that Margaret told me about this magazine last year, but I can recall the name. Do you remember, Margaret? No, I've been trying very hard as you've been talking to 
Remember yes. the name, it's definitely um, modeled on El Cordonum Sumado, yes. and it has the same kind of um, book format, and if everything is in English and Spanish, which is very exciting. Uh, Roberto, of course, was involved with Mandorla, which yes, is an extraordinary magazine, um, sadly no longer. I think one of the sad things, I mean, I think there's so much to be said for the digital uh, format, but it's sad to me in a way that um, we're sort of getting away from some of the um, paper uh, issues of magazines because they they were important objects in and of themselves. You know, you can't hold a digital magazine in your hands, no matter how hard you try. So um, they all have their place. But yeah, I think there's quite a few. I remember um, maybe 15 years ago being at the Guadalajara Book Fair, and there was a, uh, they showed the film about El Cordon Plumado, and the room was just packed. There must have been about 300 people there. And uh, in the Q&A after the film, at least 20 young Mexican uh, editors and poets um, commented publicly that they were doing projects modeled on El Corno. So um, that was exciting for me to hear as well. The, Margaret. Still lives. <laughs> and Gabriela, is the magazine Erizo the one you're thinking of? That's it. That's uh, yes. it. I'll, put the, I'll put the website on the, I think so, yes. yes. Uh, there it is in the chat. I would also just mention, because the question was about the digital, there are not so much maybe uh, modeled on Encorno necessarily, but a, a very interesting journal called Asymptote that is published out of Singapore, I believe. That is where one of its bases is, but there are editors all over the world and it's devi devoted entirely to translation. And of course, using the, the, me the medium of, uh, of the internet and the digital as a way of really having a kind of reach that, although, I'm so glad, Gabriela, that you mentioned, you know, you think to 1961 and 2000 copies of that journal were, be were being sent. I mean, it's, it's really unthinkable. I mean, it's yes. an extraordinary feat. When I think back about the fact that we didn't have the internet, we didn't have, you know, it took three to four months for a poet in uh, Buenos Aires or Santiago de Chile to send that. I mean, it took three or four months for their poems to get to us. And then two or th three or four months for us to return to them the news of whether we were gonna publish or not the poems. I mean, that's half a year. And when I think back to the uh, kinds of resources that we had back then, I can hardly believe we did this. But um, I, did, I did want to say something else and it's, it's uh, I'm, I, I think I've lost it, but um, I've lost what I wanted to say, but. Can I interject uh, yeah. here and have you say something about linotype, which is one of my favorite subjects, because I think we've forgotten well, we, exactly. We use these little, uh, these tiny little linotype uh, print shops in Mexico City. When they made the film about El Corno, um, they, it, it was hard for the filmmakers to find one that still existed because they're all gone, you know. And it was the old linotype method and, uh, and the old hot lead, you know. And we had so many incredible experiences with those linotype shop, with those shops, those print shops. I remember in particular one instance in which um, we had some uh, uh, a centerfold of photographs of very sexually suggestive um, sculptures by Shinkishi Tejiri, the great uh, Japanese uh, sculptor, and uh, with uh, women's bodies, nude bodies, and it was. Um, the printer was so scandalized that he threw those signatures out into the street and we had to pick them up. He would not publish El Corno anymore. And then we had to go find a new print shop, you know. And then that happened for political reasons too, towards the end, when the government began to, um, to prosecute the, uh, or threaten the, those little print shops, we'd had to go from one to, to another, you know, to find a place to print the magazine. So it's all very artisanal in terms of today's world, but quite wonderful. Yeah, terrific. Uh, we do have a, one question that came in sort of sideways on, on email for um, Gabriela, and I think it could also be extended to the international uh, context uh, for Jessica. 
Uh, could you say, this was initially for Gabriela, could you say a bit more about the significance of El Corno Emplumado for the Mexican cultural landscape of the 60s? It seems that this goes beyond just the student movement of 1968, even if part of the build up to it. Um, and I would, I would ask the same, but for yeah, Jessica as well to think about uh, your findings with respect to the impact of Margaret's literary and political work um, internationally in that period, how you, how you scope that work, that impact. Gabriela? Yes, of course, El Corno Emplumado goes beyond the 68 movement. Um, if we think about it, um, Del Corno first issue was published in 1962. So from 62 to 68, well, there are six years of difference. And what they published before what was going on on, this, on 68, it's really valuable. Um, El Corno had its detractors, um, a lot of um, Mexican intellectuals that were a little conservative didn't like the magazine and they used to talk bad about the magazine in in these diaries that were that were very um, distributed and but uh, El Corno also um, what, it, what it has what it has proven with uh, with time is that um, it really influenced um, some of the young writers in the moment. Uh, for example, the writers of the, the group called Espiga Motinada, like Juan, ba Juan Bañuelos, um, Martinez, etc. And for example, also the group called the Infrarrealistas that they, they were associated to Roberto Bolaño. And yeah, uh, in the moment, El Corno, I think that wasn't uh, very well understood by the critics, by the um, canonic critics, but in the underground culture in Mexico, it was very well received, um, especially because of, it had translations of the beatnik poets that were very well received by the readers of El Corno and that you couldn't get the, that kind of um, literature anywhere else, but in El Corno, no? and you have them in Spanish and that was very, that was very valuable. But yes, it goes beyond the 68 movement because it has a lot that goes um, right before right before the 68. Yeah. That's great. I'll, if I could just briefly add, um, if you haven't watched the documentary, I put it into the chat uh, on the El Corno. It has some excellent interviews and there's some there's some that give you a sense of the of the attitudes around El Corno. So even an editor, a progressive editor like Umberto Batis from Uno Mas Uno, what, yes. they were all suspicious of El Corno because they couldn't believe that it was so well produced. They were convinced it was produced by the State Department, by the US State Department, right? So he tells these stories and it's, it gives you a sense of how it was seen with it from, from very different points of view um, because of its novelty. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And to your question, Liz, that's more broader about the reception of Margaret Randall's work outside of Mexico and outside of this time period, I think you can see something that Gabriela mentioned too, is a lot of her work is covered in the underground press. Mm -hmm. So we do see it, you know, at, in various publications, you know, the Cuban Women Now and the Sandistas Daughters, so not just in 1968 too, but later in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, her publications are, are being covered. And then going back to one of your first questions actually about, you know, graduate studies, Cuban Women Now and Sandista's Daughters is something that people study in graduate school now to learn how to do oral history, you know, so it's still something that we still use and it's actually, we use it as a methodology, um, which is an interesting crossover, I think, from something that is um, showing revolution and what women's lives are like under revolution to something that now is used to show us how to do this type of research. Um, so I think that's an interesting crossover that she, that she has been able to do. Yeah, that's that's certainly true of my classes, as I've told Margaret many times. Um, my my copies of Sandina's daughters are very battered at this point. Um, I think we're coming up on our uh, the end of our session, uh, and I want to thank all of the panelists for their fine work, um, for to Giaconda and Margaret for participating, to our wonderful uh, sign language interpreters 
uh, for their work and for the uh, veritable army of helpers who aren't shown on the screen. Um, thanks to everyone. Uh, we will be coming back to this exact same Zoom link um, at uh, much later. Um, but what I'll put up now is a reminder that the Gioconda Belli conversation with Margaret Randall will be streamed on YouTube at 4 p.m. our time. And that link is available in your registration materials, as well as it will be on this slide while we um, while, while it's playing. We come back at uh, approximately 540 in the afternoon to um, again have a live discussion with uh, Gioconda Belli and Margaret Randall. And uh, I look forward very much to some of the questions that came through in the question and answer we'll be mulling over in the meantime, because they are really questions for our, our speakers in the afternoon. And uh, we hope to bring you some answers at that point. So with that, I will thank everyone uh, concluding here on time. And please in 15 minutes, go to the YouTube link and you will be able to view the wonderful conversation between Margaret and Gioconda. Thank you everyone so much. And oh, we hope to see you very soon. <laughs>